Uh, welcome, everybody, to this lecture, uh, which we uh, titled Scientific Discovery or a Colonial Theft on Indonesia's Call to Return the Du Bois Collection. Uh, this is the second installment of the, uh, in this um, academic year of the History of Science uh, lecture series, uh, organized by Studium Generale uh, and the TU Delft Library. And in this lecture series, we ask a historian from outside the TU Delft uh, to reflect on a current issue, in this case, uh, the colonial heritage that is still present at universities and national history museums. Uh, and we ask a TU Delft researcher to reflect from the present day uh, on this uh, issue and on this historical case. So, my name is Abel Streefland. Uh, I'm the host today. Uh, I work here at the library uh, as the university historian of the TU Delft, uh, which means that uh, I do research on the history of TU Delft. That's my job, basically. Um, and I can already tell you that this institute was, uh, during its history, uh, shaped profoundly by the Dutch colonial project. And we will reflect uh, more on this uh, later uh, in the afternoon. So in the coming hour, uh, we will have uh, a few little steps. First, we will have a lecture by Fenneke Siesling from Leiden University. Uh, then we will have a response by our own uh, Udo Pesch. Um, and then we will open the floor for questions. Uh, so please, if you have any questions, keep them until uh, that moment. So we will combine them. Afterwards, there's, uh, there are some drinks, uh, even more drinks, uh, and there is the possibility for an informal discussion. So, uh, as a little introduction, uh, Studium uh, Generale did on their social media channels a little poll on today's topic. I have the results here, uh, and they give, in my opinion, a nice little introduction into today's topic. Uh, so, you can see that these are percentages. I don't know how how big the group of people who responded was. Um, I just don't know that, so we have to guess uh, <laughs> how big that is. Uh, did any of you fill in the poll beforehand? No? Me neither, I didn't see it, so... <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Um, and I also don't know what kind of people filled this poll in. So if they were mainly people from TU Delft, like students or researchers, or if it was people from outside of TU Delft. But let's, let's walk through uh, some of the results because I think they pose some nice questions also for, for later on. Um, so first, the first question. Do you think the colonial past still has an impact today? 96% of uh, the responders said yes. Do you agree? If you think yes, please raise your hand. Yeah, it's almost 96%. I think this is perfect. <laughs> uh, then the second one. Uh, do you think the TU Delft has a colonial background? 53% of the respondents thought yes. 36% uh, didn't know. So dark pink is I don't know and light pink is no. Um, so most people uh, think there is a colonial uh, background at the TU Delft. Well, I already <laughs> said that that is actually true. I, as a historian, can say that that is true. Um, and I think we will uh, later in this afternoon uh, go into that a little bit deeper. The third question, should, this is another kind of question, should all artifacts taken from former colon colonies be given back? That's a very nice question. Um, 74% of the people, so th uh, uh, three quarters, think that uh, all artifacts taken from former colonies be given back. Uh, that's actually quite quite a lot. <laughs> also, if you uh, if you look at the general opinion in the Netherlands, I don't think it will be three quarters of all the people. So just to see what what we have here, if you think uh, yes on this question, please raise your hand. Should all artifacts taken from former colonies be given back? W it's a bit hesitant. Yeah, what does it mean? What are artifacts? All artifacts, really? And 
be given back to whom? Maybe that might be a question that pops up. So this this uh, well leaves quite a, quite well brings up other questions. I would say. Then the next one: Do you think universities and museums need to take responsibility for the colonial past? Fifty-eight percent said yes. Twenty percent did no, and twenty-two percent said no, no responsibility. So what do you think? If you think yes on this question, please raise your hand again. Yes. Well, that most of the people actually, it is more than 50, what was it? 58% for sure. Um, okay, that's good to know. Uh, and then the last question, which is actually quite similar to the third one we had. Should all natural objects taken from former colonies be given back? So the difference is that here we are talking about artifacts and here we are talking about natural objects. It does make a difference though, because with the artifacts, 74% of the people thought it should, all of them should be given back. And with the natural objects, only 60% thought it should be given back. What do you think? If you think yes for this question, please raise your hand again. Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. This leaves room for more questions, I would say. What are natural objects? How do they differ from artifacts? And this also poses the question, yeah, what are artifacts then? Um, and then again, all of them, and should be given back to whom? So it leaves room for, for different questions. Um, just to make clear, this is actually quite different from uh, the stance that the Dutch state uh, has on this. Uh, so the Dutch state thinks that there should first be a request to give something back before uh, you can actually decide if you should give it back. Uh, that does then also imply that you shouldn't give everything back. You should only give things back that are asked for. Um, so that's already an interesting distinction here. Okay, I think we are now... Uh, well, this was a nice introduction um, for this topic. We have some questions already in the room. Um, then the next step is for me to introduce Fenneke Siesling. Uh, Fenneke is an assistant professor at the University of Leiden, specializing in the history of science and colonialism. Uh, she wrote the book Radical Science and Human Diversity in Colonial Indonesia, <laughs> right? <laughs> which uh, came out in 2016 and was about the Dutch physical anthropologists uh, who in the 19th and 20th century tried to categorize the peoples living in Indonesia uh, by measuring their skulls and faces and bodies and those kind of things. Uh, her upcoming project is about medical practices and ethics in colonial Southeast Asia. And her interests include colonial heritage, museum objects, and natural history. Okay, so the floor is yours. I will put your presentation on the screen. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Abu. And thank you, Studium Generale, for that uh, great image drawing that uh, you've come up with. Um, I may return um, back to that image later on, but now I want to take you to this field site at the Solo River on the island of Java, um, where forced laborers were working and digging um, somewhere here between the flags where this paleontological dig was um, taking place. They were about um, 500 kilometers from uh, Batavia, the capital of the Dutch East Indies, the Netherlands' largest colony um, at the time. Um, and this, the 1890s, was a period of uh, the intensification of Dutch imperialism um, so new regions were coming under Dutch control. The forced laborers who worked here did so for a young Dutch medical doctor, Eugène Dubois, um, who was employed by the Dutch East Indies Army, but was given time off to do um, scientific work. He was interested in human evolution, and he believed 
that there was an intermediate species between humans and their ape-like ancestors. And he was also convinced that this species probably had lived in the tropics and why not Indonesia, which uh, did have a population of, um, of apes, orang utans. Um, so that was a, you know, a possible uh, finding place for fossils of this um, ancestors. He first did research on um, um, the neighboring island of Sumatra, but he had uh, little success there and then moved on to Java to search here on the river banks of the river Solo. And he was right and very lucky also because in 1891 his laborers dug up um, a skull cap um, and a molar and they brought it to, uh, you know, they, they did all the digging, they brought the uh, their finds to the foreman, and the foreman then brought the fossils to um, Eugène um, Dubois. And a couple of months later, they also found the thigh bone, the femur that you can see um, on the right. So it's three, um, uh, three bits in total. They're um, copied each here. Um, Dubois' health was not very good, so he spent most of his time in the house he, he um, lived in on his veranda where he collected all the fossils around him. Um, and when the foreman came to present this new find, he did recognize this find as something very special, something not altogether human, but also uh, not entirely ape-like. It was a missing link. He named the find Pithecanthropus erectus, or upright apeman. Um, and today it's called a Homo erectus. Um, uh, a Homo erectus. Uh, and after Dubois's initial find, many other finds uh, of Homo erectus fossils um, have been done in the same region um, along the same river banks. But this was the first one. Um, these, were, these bones were the first one um, ever found. So Eugène Dubois considered these finds as his own and he brought them um, back to the Netherlands a couple years later. Um, he had a special suitcase made for them and, and took them um, uh, on the ship and apparently kept them at his side the whole time. He found it difficult, difficult to part with uh, his fossils um, you know, the rest of his life, even though um, government officials said that he should hand over his fossils um, uh, to the museum, to a Dutch museum. Um, apparently, he, the, the story goes that he kept the fossils under his bed and that even when international scientists just rang his doorbell um, to come and see um, these famous remain, remains, he did not always open the door. Eventually though, but then it was already decades later, he um, brought Java men and the thousands of other fossils um, that he had collected to the museum and the collection is now um, in Naturalis, the you know, National Natural History Museum in Leiden. Um, Dubois really became famous for this um, find. There was a lot of scientific controversy also about it. Um, and when he died in 1940, um, he had this tombstone made. It's still there if you visit his grave um, uh, in um, Limburg in the Netherlands. And you can see the skull cap and the, the thigh bone um, on his grave. So, was this, as the title of this talk says, scientific discovery or colonial theft? Well, it was almost, well, certainly a scientific discovery, even if Dubois couldn't have done this all by himself. So some of the credits for this discovery must go to his assistants, 
to the forced laborers, but Dubois was the only one um, who could <coughs> recognize these three pieces as you know, something really special. And he was prepared to defend them um, against his critics. It also wasn't really theft, colonial theft, in the sense of some uh, other categories uh, of colonial looted art. When you think of looted art, you probably think of um, palaces that were ransacked by the Dutch when they um, had conquered indigenous kingdoms. Um, looted art is also the, the krises, the sacred knives that uh, people used to commit suicide if they uh, didn't want to be subjected um, to the Dutch. Um, these were objects taken um, in moments of extreme violence. But here we have you know, a set of natural history objects. But then were these natural history objects just there for the taking? There weren't any Dutch colonial laws that regulated this kind of collecting activities yet. But even at the time already, just like in the Netherlands, Dutch colonial officials were very annoyed that Dubois had shipped his fossils home. They would have liked to keep them in the Dutch East Indies where they had museums and scientists too, and they would have liked to study this collection. Um, so even though this is not sort of a clear-cut case of looted art, last year in 2022, Indonesia <coughs> claimed Java men and the entire Dubois collection of um, fossils. Where did that claim come from? Um, in the remainder of this talk, I'll say more about what led to this claim. Um, and I hope to say more about the role of natural history museums in the discussion about uh, how to deal with the colonial past. What can they do today to address issues of colonialism? So let's move from the 1890s to 19, uh, the 1940s. Um, as I said, Dubois died in 1940, and then between 1945 and 1949, Indonesia fought its war of independence. And after independence, the Dutch and Indonesians had to negotiate uh, about how to transfer power, and that included um, talks about the sort of cultural aspect um, um, of this transfer. And I write, I write about this history, by the way, um, in a paper that I wrote with my uh, colleague, Caroline Drienhuizen. So she um, did some of the research um, um, that we wrote about. It was in the early 1950s that, for the first time, an Indonesian politician demanded the restitution of several Indonesian objects then in Dutch hands. And this politician was um, Mohamed Yamin, member of parliament and later minister of um, education and culture in Indonesia. And Mohamed Yamin had Java men on his list of objects too. These fossils he claimed um, had to return to Indonesia. And we have to realize that at this point, Java men was not only a specimen with a scientific meaning, um, Java men was more than that. It also had cultural and natural, national significance um, in Indonesia. And Java men, we think, was particularly important in this new nationalistic narrative um, that Yamin um, had formulated. So um, the, the minister, Yamin, tried to, in this period, tried to get rid of a sort of a, his, a colonial historical narrative and wanted a new history for Indonesia in which the influence of colonial rule was minimalized and pre-colonial domestic strength was 
um, was emphasized. So Java men and the other and the other fossils could show in this narrative that in Indonesians had a very long lineage, that Java was one of the oldest inhabited places uh, in the world. And then 300 years of Dutch colonialism, you know, um, didn't um, wasn't a lot on that time scale. In addition to being cultural objects, Yamin argued, um, these fossils were all also priceless for their prehistorical for the prehistorical and anthropological sciences. So they were crucial for um, scientific research and higher education in Indonesia. After independence, Indonesia faced the task of educating a whole new generation of students and to rebuild the scientific infrastructure that had been left depleted with the departure um, of the Dutch. Um, so the fossils um, for um, Yamin uh, and his colleagues symbolized a sort of scientific, Dutch scientific imperialism that impeded scientific progress in Indonesia. In the 1950s, um, the, the talks between uh, the Netherlands and Indonesia um, broke, were broken off. They did not lead to um, some sort of cultural agreement. Uh, and relations were sour um, for um, a couple of years until the 1970s when relations um, ameliorated again. And then the um, issue was of repatriation was back on the table. <coughs> and, uh, and then the Netherlands was actually a bit more open towards repatriation. In the second half of the 1970s, several objects such as archives, but also a famous uh, Prachna Paramita statue uh, were returned to Indonesia. It was in this period that Indonesian um, paleontologists, that an Indonesian paleontologist started to voice his ideas that Java men belonged in Indonesia. Teku Jakob uh, was trained in the Netherlands, but he became the most important paleontologist of Indonesia until his death in 2007. And he began to say in newspapers in the 1970s that he wanted Java men back from the Netherlands. Like Yamin, he argued that the bones were of great value for uh, academic research in Indonesia, um, but he made no reference to an the ancient Javanese past or the greatness of Indonesia, perhaps um, because um, he was more of a scientist and less um, of a politician and historian, such as Yamin. Jacob's calls for return worried one man in the Netherlands in particular, the director of the Natural History Museum, where Java Man was, um, was held. There is a file in the National Archives with correspondence between the director Willem Vervoort um, and um, the, uh, the minister and Vervoort was angry. He was afraid that um, he would have to, the museum would have to part with its uh, fossil collection. So in his letter to the minister, he writes that the, fossil, uh, the fossils in, of the Dubois collection had nothing at all to do with the Dutch colonial past. Scientific heritage, he wrote, should not be discussed with emotional and nationalistic argument, arguments, but only with detached scientific interest. Emotional arguments, he argued, were valid for ethnographical objects, but did not hold for fossils. This was, in fact, of course, the protective nationalistic, Eurocentric consideration, and he was actually quite emotional about it. Um, but his arguments were about um, um, detached uh, science. 
I think this argument about the difference between ethnographical objects and natural history objects is also important for us today because um, then in the 1970s, the director really tried to emphasize the division between nature and culture. And this division in the Netherlands has also been institutionalized in museums. So we've got ethnographic museums on the one hand, natural history museums um, on the other hand. And until today, natural history museums have stayed outside discussions about the legacy of colonialism, while ethnographic museums uh, have been part of these discussions um, for much longer. Um, so in the 1970s, a, a couple of government officials were asked to look at the case to be able to say whether uh, Tauke Jakob had a point. And they had to admit that if one argued that Dubois was employed by the Dutch colonial government and that Indonesia was the successor of that government, then perhaps Java men should belong in Indonesia. But at that time, nothing really hap happened. The officials took years to um, produce their, um, their report about the case and uh, Taku Jakob didn't press the point, so it all petered out. Then, in the last couple of decades, discussions about ethnographical objects from a colonial context, but also about colonial human remains in museums have arrived in the Netherlands. And um, while our neighboring countries with colonial pasts, so, uh, Germany, France, the UK and Belgium have each come up with their own solutions to deal um, with um, questions of repatriations. The Dutch appointed a committee, with the Consalves um, Committee, which produced a report in 2020 with guidelines that are now official government policy. And the guidelines say that all objects from a colonial context which are claimed and which are clearly looted should go back. But the report also says that when items are of special national or cultural significance, the Netherlands should be open to discuss their possible return. And then when Indonesia came with their list of claims, Java men, Java men was there as well. So an example, not of the looted art category, um, but of the category of objects with cultural or natural national significance. Now, will, will the Natural History Museum return these objects? Um, should they return these objects? I'm in favor um, of a um, return, um, but because it's really the, the first uh, official claim of its kind, I don't think it's going to be an easy nut to crack. Um, and if they return, they will never make everyone in Indonesia happy. Which museum will they go to? Which scientists are going to be in charge of the fossils? Perhaps Java men's going to be used in a very nationalistic display that's very Java-centric at the expense of other regions of Indonesia. But then, once you transfer, you have nothing at all to say uh, about that. So that's something to um, discuss, but um, something that the Dutch don't have any influence on anymore. Um, and I'm, the image that you see is from um, um, the museum near the fossil sites, which is um, devoted entirely to fossils um, and our human ancestors. Um, and as you can see, um, it already says, you know, the homeland of Java men. So um, there's already this, this story of, you know, this is where Java man is from. This is where he belongs. 
And whether Javaman returns or not, does that mean natura Naturalis, the Natural History Museum, has done its job in terms of, um, kind of coming to terms with their colonial past? Um, I don't think so. It's a, a task of um, museums and other institutes to give the colonial past uh, more than an occasional uh, thought. Uh, and so far, Naturalis has hardly paid any um, attention to this colonial past. And Java Men is really only one of their stories. Uh, the majority of um, Naturalis's collections are from the former Dutch colonies. So there's lots of other stories um, that should be told about the museum's uh, roots in the colonial past, the ways um, science and the collections were influenced by the colonial context, and also how the, the museum and uh, its scientists were entangled with the Dutch colonial projects. So that's um, you know, a whole lot to do um, for um, the museum. And I have a couple of other sort of suggestions for the museum uh, on the sort of things that they um, could start to look at. But I think I'm going to leave it at this, because there will be plenty uh, of things to discuss. And we can always um, 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 broaden the discussion later on. Uh, during question times. Thank you very much um, um, for listening to me. I do hope you have questions so we, we can continue the discussion. Test. No. Does it work? It does work. Great. Hooray. I need to push a button, though. Uh, thank you so much, Fenneke. Um, I will quickly change the presentation back to the other one. Do, 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 do. Yep. Are we there? We are there, because then I can introduce <coughs> Udo to you. Udo will give a short response on Fenneke, her talk. And afterwards, I will open the floor uh, for, for, for everybody. So if you have any questions that are really lingering, please stick to them for a little longer. Uh, so Udo Pesch is an associate professor in ethics and technology at the Department of Values, Technology and Innovation um, of the Faculty of Technology, Policy and Management. Those are a lot, a lot of words in a slur. Uh, at the TU Delft. Um, he has a strong multidisciplinary background in philosophy, science, policy, uh, policy science, sorry, in political <laughs> theory and innovation studies. Uh, and his main focus is on the democratization of infrastructures, most notably within the context of the energy transition. Uh, other disciplinary interests include responsible innovation, participatory decision-making, environmental politics, public policies, and ethics. Uh, and we asked him today uh, to, uh, to uh, well, listen to Fenneker, her story, to reply on that and to think also of that from a modern day uh, perspective and especially for people who are, who are studying uh, here at TU Delft nowadays. What can they take out of this story uh, for their, uh, well, future? So, Udo, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you, Fenneke, for a, a great story. Um, I don't have a power slides, uh, what PowerPoint slides, because um, I just don't know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's a completely new area for me, um, and, and I mean, I can easily talk for hours about things I don't know anything about, but I will just uh, take a couple of minutes. Um, and the reason I'm not an expert in this particular subject is not because of lack of interest, but because we are at this university where tend to be looking forward to the future and we're future oriented and hey here's the past nice done <laughs> been there done that you know let's let's move on let's make new technologies um, which is a shame uh, because there's so much obviously we can learn and there's so almost so so many injustices that we still need to relate to somehow uh, and it is kind of hidden uh, to to us um, um, researchers, teachers, but also to students. So there's a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, basically, a big uh, lack of knowledge here. 
Um, and especially if you also compare it, I mean, the whole debate on decolonization, um, it's going on quite vividly at other universities and here at this university we hardly have anything. Um, and also, I mean, I, I, I take a part of the blame. I have been very naive, and it was only with uh, Annelien, who's here, when she did her uh, very, uh, very good uh, master thesis on, um, say, nickel mining in West Papua, um, which for is for the sake of, you know, basically nurturing the, the European and Northern American energy transition. Um, that opened my eyes because you now I've been working on the energy transition. I think yeah, that's cool. We need that. Um, but then Anlin found out that there's a lot of injustices, basically uh, colonial injustice, being reproduced for uh, yeah, the, f the sake of our prosperity. So that, that really opened my eyes. And I think that that shows that we really have to engage with these questions about uh, our colonial past. And especially also looking to the future, how can we deal with injustices that are still being reproduced uh, if we consider this colonial past? Um, engaging with this debate, it, it does lead to a lot of frustration because um, the way it's being held, especially at these other universities, because we don't hold it yet, um, it's, it's very wordy, very conceptual, a lot of big words, a lot of quite unnuanced statements are being made that, that lead to a lot of frustration and a lot of antagonism. And I think that's not a very productive debate that we are going. I think we need to face the injustices that we are part of, that we reproduce, um, but also do so from a um, yeah, nuanced and sophisticated and, and well-informed uh, angle. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of strong positions being forwarded, and I think um, there are so many complexities here. I think Fenneke's story showed some of these complexities. I think, um, I mean, if you would ask me these very blunt questions that I will start with, you know, should all artifacts be returned to, uh, yeah, the, the, the previous co the former colonies? Then you, all, what are I mean? Then then you start you know you have to open up this black box. You have to start thinking about what it actually is, and then it turns out to be really complicated, and Fenneke's story on the Dubois collection really showed yeah, what these complications are. I mean, Dubois didn't steal them. I mean, he f well, he, his work has found it for him, um, but it, it wasn't looting or something. Um, it wasn't, uh, um, I mean, it's not a cultural heritage. I mean, it's not part of the Indonesian cultural her heritage. It's more than 100,000 years ago, so it has no connection in the culture and the practices of the people currently living in uh, Indonesia. Um, and also Dubois was a strange person. I mean, he has this very complicated relation with the Dutch government. He was not part of the regime. He's from the southern part of the Limburg, which was basically a colony at that time. I mean, it's a, it's a very weird relation and, and, and he was a very complicated person. So it ma this make also ma made it really hard to come to a, a, a decisive conclusion on how, yeah, what to do with the Dubois collection. Um, still, I think um, there's something to be said here. And I think my when, when I was preparing this, I was thinking about, okay, wh you know, what, what do I think of it? What, what is going on here? Uh, and what's our relation as a university um, with this colonial past? And then you do find out that there is this strong relation. And uh, as Abel said, um, this university has is being founded based on, yeah, basically the, the existence of these colonies, um, the the yeah the polytechnical uh, high school hochschool. What, what <laughs> so our university was basically based on, hey, we have Indonesia and we have to explore Indonesia. We have to have the tools, the measurements, uh, the technologies that allow us to map out what Indonesia is. Later we came, I mean, we we have. Uh, strong relations with companies like Shell and Unilever, which obviously extracted their materials from the Indonesian soil, um, which allowed us to become very rich, which allowed us our science to become really strong. And I think this is my main point. Um, the reason why we have this high level of uh, high quality level of, of, of science, why we have this top university here is at least partly, um, can be partly are attributed to our relations or the historical relations that we had with Indonesia. That we were able to get wealth, you know, as 
the Netherlands as a country, um, but also to have the resources, um, the mining, the extraction, the extractivism of you now people living there that we can use to to find um, these bones. In, in, um, the, the ecosystem that are now being destroyed for nickel mining, the people that are being uh, um, um, extracted for, for doing things, the forest that we need for uh, palm oil and all, all those kinds of things. We still reproduce these extractivist practices and they nurture, they stimulate our wealth, um, not only in terms of money, but especially in terms of the, the capacity to create knowledge. And I think this gives us a really a big responsibility, a responsibility for these global injustices. And not these injustices from the past, because we're still, f no, we're still forward looking, we look at the future. But we have to do something about the injustices that are still being reproduced and that we can do something about. Um, and this is a very, very hard discussion, obviously. Now, how can you restore these uh, injustices? And then you talk about things like compensation and how can you compensate? What's the, you know, what's the financial, what are the financial aspects? I mean, very complicated. But at least if we return now to the Dewar collection, we can say, well, we can do something here. We can return these, uh, these fossils to Indonesia to basically help Indonesia build up its quality of uh, of science um, and I think we uh, do have the responsibility apart from all legal and uh, formal formalities here I think we should help Indonesia becoming a more prosperous country with all complications that are there that's my story thanks thank you Udo that was a great response thanks, thanks. So I will now open the floor uh, for questions. I will walk around <laughs> with this mic, uh, and then I will give it to the person who, uh, who wants to ask something. So who wants to ask something in the corner? Um, I have a question uh, first on, on the introduction. Uh, there was this, um, this um, the difference between natural objects and artifacts, so that hasn't been solved yet, so uh, I would be curious. And my other question would be to, uh, uh, yeah, actually to both of them. Udo said that, if I understood well, that the the Java man fossils are not part of the cultural heritage because they're too old. And I was wondering where, what is the definition actually is there? Because yeah, for me that's not a natural thing to say. So to answer your first question. Uh, the way I understand it, artifacts are things that are man-made, uh, and natural objects are things that are taken from nature. So, for example, fossils or bones or those kinds <coughs> of things. Um, yeah, <laughs> that that would be that would be an answer. But of course, there are some things that are made of natural objects, and there are still artifacts, as in that they are they are carved or whatever. And then you get to something that's both an <coughs> artifact and a natural uh, object. So there are all these these other uh, categories as well. But in general, I would think that's the the division between the two. But do you want to answer the second part of the question? Yeah, uh, sh uh, yeah, sure. I mean. Um, I mean, it's not a precise argument that I've given, but uh, at least you can expect that. I mean, uh, Fennecke talked about these crystals, which are part of the tradition and which, I I within the Indonesian culture, you could still recognize. But the practices that the Avaman had, I mean, they're 100,000 years old. I mean, you can, I cannot imagine that some of the practices developed in that time still uh, are still reproduced in, in, in contemporary Indonesian society. So. You cannot recognize, I mean, we, we in, the, in Europe, we cannot recognize the Neanderthaler uh, um, practices, even though they're much more recent than this. Uh, so I would say things of, I mean, look at a history, um, yeah, I'm not a historian, I'm always future forward looking, <laughs> but I would say things that are more than, let's say, 1,000, 1,500 years old, do not have, you know, uh, are not reproduced in our current understanding of the world, well, may, maybe 2,500 years, maybe, for us, it's a, starting with Greek or mm. something. I mean, we still know the text, uh, we know these practices, we know what people did, and we still reproduce them in our practice, in, in our teaching, etc., etc. But I think there's nothing from the Yavamen or the Neanderthals that, you know, that we still 
maintain within our, uh, say, in, in, in our um, yeah, body of meanings. Yeah, I think you said uh, they don't have any cultural significance, which in Indonesia, which I don't think is the case, but because obviously they're seen as very important objects. Yeah, so, so, right. yeah, I mean, uh, obviously now you see this debate emerging. I mean, uh, the, the, the example that uh, yeah. of uh, Minister Yamin was his name. Yeah. I mean, obviously they are now part, they become part of uh, Indonesian culture, but it's an exposed you know, uh, projection. Uh, it's also an argument in this debate that, um, um, yes, because Java Man is not a a actually the ancestor of Indonesians, it's, it's more you know, anyone's ancestor yeah. than the Indonesian ancestors, um, perhaps Leiden is a good place, or any place is a good place um, um, for these fossils. So that, or that that argument does play a role. Are there any more questions? One in the back. One in the back. I may <coughs> dwell a little bit upon that argument. How would you then look at the Parthenon frieze, for example, <coughs> displayed at the British Museum with demands for, uh, of the Greek government to return it? To what extent do the modern Greeks need to prove that that, that, that is still the origin of their <coughs> current culture? You know, the ancient finds. You could argue that's not your lineage. The modern heritage of, you know, democracy can be found <laughs> all over the world. Well, they're a bit younger than <laughs> Java men. Okay, but you see you're getting into a very yeah, but uh, okay. Let me okay. Here. Let me come back to the because uh, you're judging for no others. No, I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to counter the arguments that are being given, and uh, the part, I mean these examples are pr clearly stolen from the people I mean by the British, uh, and that's Actually, a different thing. So <laughs> you always get this round of it's been being stolen. It's uh, means part of the heritage, um, and it you know, uh, and it's part of. Um, the colonial regimes did it. And I think in the Dubois case, each of these arguments has least less validity than in, for instance, this, this Creek case or, I mean, uh, or even Clearer's case. I don't think the distinction is whether something is stolen or not. It was taken. There are all kinds of you know, circumstantial evidence that the fact that this Parthenon freeze was taken, that there was some kind of approval. You know. But the point is that at that point, uh, Travelers or colonial travelers recognize the importance of something that was maybe not recognized yet in the context of that particular place. And that is different now because now there is that recognition and there's a museum, let's say, waiting for it, like there is a museum waiting for Japan. So I think, in terms of cultural significance, I don't think there's any way to downplay that there is cultural significance and it's very clear in Indonesia. And Java man is part of, like, of course we have something, we all have something in common with Java man, so we cannot say that the Indonesians would not have that, you know. We all uh, have <coughs> learned, like, we, we are all in that of Darwinism and knowing uh, or lineage, let's say. So, I don't know, like, I think it's a troubling argument. Yeah, I don't disagree with you, I mean, it, but it's an argument that can be countered, that, that's what I wanted to convey here. I mean, uh, I fully, I mean, I fully agree that, um, as it's now seen as part of the heritage, that's for me another reason. But I know that people that want to keep Java men here, or the, 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 these remains here, they can say, yeah, but you don't have anything to do with it. So I wanted to basically um, um, dodge this argument by saying, okay, but we do have responsibility for um, building up the scientific capital of the, you know, uh, in, in, in Indonesia. The same goes for, for the Greek sit situation. I think the British... A museum, or say the the the, the, the former colon colonizers have the responsibility now to do something for the colonies. Um, Greek might not have been a colony, but at least it was pillaged for for uh, taking all these things to the British Museum. I also think that you're you're right in sign in saying that if some of this heritage was not recognised at the time it may not have been there at all today. 
and you know that that can be a reason to celebrate the heroes of the past. But at the same time, at, at the time that was in in a colonial context in which one party was the more powerful party with the you know most of the money and most of the um, scientific infrastructure, and that was why they were able you know, to do that and to recognize all these things outside Europe. And that's also, and that, that is a reason that we want retribution today. Of course. Mm -hmm. um, so when, like, part of our, let's say, the Western, the heritage of Western, you know, science, uh, investigating things like the Java man, having the hypothesis of, you know, the lineage. Also, the ar archaeology, uh, you know, all these Westerners going to Italy, Greece, digging up Egypt, of course. That itself has become, of course, a paradigm, like, you know, that, that um, has created paradigms of science that are now recognized all over the world including in Indonesia, including, of course, in Greece, wanting to be part of that paradigm, which is indeed why Java men can also go to Indonesia. Yes, the, you know, my argument would definitely be that if Java men is a sort of a universal um, heritage, then that's also a good reason to have it in um, Indonesia where all of us from the West too can go and um, and visit and well, give. More than the other way around, at least. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, uh, Jules. Uh, thanks. Um, I have a question, kind of a fact question, that, and then also a question to follow up on Udo's suggestion of what responsibilities we have going forward. So the first question is, <coughs> um, maybe I just missed this in the talk, but. I'm curious if there is more to the requests of repatriation or return of these remains from Indonesia along the lines of something restorative or reparative, um, kind of in line with what Udo was saying. And so, yeah, that's kind of the fact question. And then also maybe, yeah, when we're thinking in other cases about reparations, often it's not just about kind of like repaying what was taken, which is, the, in this case, the return of these fossils. But what Udo was saying is that, yeah, perhaps there's a, another added responsibility about what kind of future relationship or what kind of things going forward might be the responsibility of the colonizer in this case. It, yeah, could you say more about like what, what that might, I don't know, be? And maybe it's also in relation to what Indonesia is asking for or what, um, yeah. It's kind of a question that might be complicated because I think both of you have part of the answer or can, yeah, thanks. Yes, I do think that's one reason for Indonesia to ask um, these fossils is um, because they, 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 they do still feel um, like they're, like they're behind in terms of scientific development, um, that they cannot make as much investment into science as they um, <coughs> would like, cannot send all their students to Europe or the US. Um, and that, um, that that is a reason that they would um, want the fossils um, in Indonesia for a new generation of students who can do their projects on um, uh, these fossils. So it will, um, yes, it will bring scientific progress to uh, Indonesia. So that's, that's that definitely one of the reasons. Um, the, and then there is also, so yes, of course, the question about sort of the colonial past and feelings about the um, colonial past. And there is, I think, it's, there's sort of a, Indonesia is always in, is also influenced by how we in the Netherlands um, now discuss the legacy of our colonial past. Um, and it is 
I think the, the Dutch colonial past is considered important in Indonesia to some, to some extent, I think. Um, but at the same, same time, you know, there has been a lot of past already after 1949, you know, with lots of um, um, developments, dictatorship, um, genocide. Um, so it's, all, it's also already a bit longer, um, um, the further away um, for many Indonesians. I think, but it also it also means that they will Indonesia will never claim all objects back because this is a, a, a form of retribution, and it will, you know, it may feel good to have Java men back because of its cultural significance and because of <coughs> science, but that does not necessarily mean that they also want the half a million butterflies from Eastern um, Indonesia that are also in the museum. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Andrea. Um, um, I think step one is coming to terms with our colonial past and talking about us here. I mean, uh, and I mean, we are ten years behind with compared to France and and uh, and Germany. Uh, we're kind of the same level of, as the UK, which also kind of clings onto its uh, colonial past. I mean, this discussions we are so annoyingly and frustratingly backward here. I mean, it's, um, it's almost insane. So before we can really start thinking about, okay, what does retribution really mean? Uh, because that, that's a really complex question. I think we easily have to engage with five to 10 years of frustrating dialogue, or that's not the dialogue, I mean, a controversy about, yes, but we are not colonizers, and we're not racist. No, uh, I mean, it's science, it belongs here, you know, those kinds of things. Um, I mean, the Dutch are really backward in, in with regards to the, these kinds of issues, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I'm, I'm always saying, okay, uh, the, I mean, I, I'm really glad that the, the, the Netherlands is so small and we just do what Germany does 10 years later and then mm -hmm. I think then it will, we will end up there in, the, in the right direction. But, uh, oh, I wanted to add to that, that, I wanted to add to that also that um, Repatriation is really only one thing. It's about physical objects going from one place to the other. But there is also, you know, the whole, th the whole sort of intellectual, um, uh, the, the coloniality in our thinking that needs to be addressed. And I, in a way, you can say that repatriation can be the first step, but it shouldn't be the only step. It should mean that uh, you know, more cooperation between Indonesia and the Netherlands, um, you know, um, about, about sort of the paleo paleontology, but also about perhaps about how past paleontologists have sort of pushed the science in a particular direction at the expense of another direction. I think there's time for one or two more questions. You were first. Here you go. I have more of a remark because I, th I think you said one thing that was really important in your question. We have to inventorize what does Indonesia want? Because attempts have been made before development aid, for example, uh, educational aid, which was very paternalistic. Um, so we have to ask, what do you want? And what do you need? And yes, we need to have discussions and a change of mentality here in the Netherlands, but also <coughs> ask, and yeah, that basically. Yes, but to, to know, you know what you want at all, it's also important that you know what the Netherlands has got. So, um, you know, to... Um, Yes, to know what's in the, the Natural History Museum. They actually, they do have a pretty good uh, database, but you would want to push that a little bit more, uh, perhaps, to, um, to Indonesians. Um, and the same is true yeah, for um, Delft and its uh, history of an entanglement with um, colonialism. Um, so this was actually a question that I wanted to ask you. So the, the, the Java Mens, I think, is only one example of, of a lot of objects that have been kept. And mm -hmm. then some of them are in, a, in, a, in Naturalis, but then also a lot of these objects are at different places. For example, at this university, but then also at a lot of other universities. Um, 
uh, and not only universities, but then broader speaking, also uh, also uh, uh, other museums, etc. <laughs> you were making strange sounds. Um, uh, so what would your advice be to those institutions, so not only Naturalis, but also the other institutions, to do first? What would be first steps uh, in, in, well, dealing with this uh, stuff? Well, so also in continuation with the last question, so there's, you can always sort of start with your own collection and think about how you can um, make them more visible um, or transparent for uh, the outside world, including Indonesia. And at the same time, um, you know, think about your Indonesian counterparts, whoever that uh, may be and what they may think. And, you know, it's not impossible to get in touch with Indonesians and ask them what they think, um, you know, through um, a lot of really good um, <coughs> Provenance research in museums have, have, has been done just through, you know, the snowballing method. Just ask one person and they'll ask the, ne the next and they'll, they'll ask the next. And so you'll, you'll get to know what Indonesians find important um, and what not. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. So there was one question in the middle. Oh, it's a small remark. Uh, small remark. Are you Oh, you're all talking about institutions, but there are in the Netherlands many private <coughs> collections. And that's a, a question of good or bad uh, conscience. Yeah. I know in my own family there are very nice objects, but <laughs> I'm afraid uh, most of my family me members don't want to uh, return them to Indonesia. Though they have good relations with their Indonesian family, but they are part of their own uh, private inheritance. And I, I hope uh, they will be respected. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you had a question? Yes, that will be the <laughs> last one. <laughs> well, funnily enough, it's actually right in line with this because my question was, you know, if we are putting the full onus on them to request their objects back, like, <coughs> how many means are we giving them right now to do so? Um, you know, not just in information and access, but also in time, in funding, in people. So it's more of a curious question if you guys yeah. have any overview, how much? Um, I don't know how much, but the Dutch government has allocated money to the, this um, repatriation project. So um, in the, um, there's, there's talks going on already, Indonesian um, um, representative have have visited the Netherlands, visited Naturalis also. Um, so talks have started, and things like their um, I don't know, their flight tickets. Yes, they're they're covered by um, um, the sum that the Dutch government has allocated to the project. Yeah, and even broader than that, the Dutch government also made a conglomerate, I think, with parties that can help you do providence research, for example which doesn't make it easier to, to, to bring in a claim, but it makes it easier to find out how uh, other institutions than institutions from the state uh, got their uh, stuffs or objects of artifacts. So there are things, things happening. This is all quite recent, I have to say. OK. I <laughs> is just it? got the, the number of euros. Today. Oh, you got oh, the number yeah. of euros, which Why is? Not? Uh, That's quick. 2022, it's 1.4 million. 1.4 million. Okay, that doesn't sound like a very big deal. <laughs> I don't know. Well, okay. It's quite a lot of plane tickets. <laughs> it's, that's true. It's quite a lot of plane tickets. Uh, that's true. Okay, um, so I, I want to close up. Uh, a warm welcome to uh, Fenneke and Udo for uh, the lecture and the response. Please give them a round of applause. Okay. I want to thank Studium Generale as well for organizing this, uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, I want to thank Susanna Murzin for making this uh, very nice picture. I don't know if Susanna is here. No, she's not. <laughs> um, uh, and I also want to thank you all for attending. Um, if you want to hear more about the, some future events, um, Please uh, subscribe to the Studium Generale uh, mailing list at their website, sg.tudelft.nl. Um, 
And uh, we aim to have a next event in the history of science a lecture series in June or, uh, well, in the beginning of the summer. So please feel free to uh, have another drink. There are also some snacks available. Uh, and stick around to continue the discussion and just uh, mingle with each other and talk to each other. <laughs> Thank you.